This is Tales from the Pros, where business leaders and influencers share their stories of inspiration, struggles, and successes. And I'm your host, Michael Giorgio. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Tales from the Pros. This is Michael Giorgio, your host and co-founder at Imagine Ovation. My wonderful guest with me here today is the founder of Speedwork Social, a top LinkedIn advertising agency. As a previous tech founder and ex-IBMer, he has seen a lot of companies have explosive growth with good te technology and good marketing, while others, even though they had a great product or service, fail without effective marketing. In 2016, this successful entrepreneur started Speedwork to help those companies unlock their B2B marketing potential by blending his experience in marketing and software. He is able to help businesses reach high-level decision makers at scale using LinkedIn ads and technology. He is known as one of the top LinkedIn ad experts in the industry, having managed millions in ad spend and generating over 100,000 new sales opportunities. Please welcome Anthony Blattner. Anthony, thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. And also, everyone, I want to give um, Anthony a, a little bit of a shout out here. You know, we're, we're actually, me and my company, uh, we're a, a client of, of Anthony's uh, Speedwork Social. So we're very excited to work together and you guys, uh, you got to check them out. So very, very exciting stuff, man. So thanks, for, thanks again for being here. Yeah, you'll get to see firsthand how all this good stuff works and uh, report on the results in a couple episodes. <laughs> yeah, sounds good, man. Sounds good. So you know, uh, Anthony, I was, as I was telling you before, uh, you know, before uh, the episode, before we started this is, you know, story, uh, Tales from the Pros is a business storytelling podcast. So I really want to get into uh, just a little bit of your background and how things started for you. I know uh, Speedwork Social has been going on for at least a few years now, right? Yeah. Yeah. We just rebranded yeah. from modern media to Speedwork. So that's right. Yeah. So if you want to give us some background on that, man, like how, how things kind of started and you don't, don't worry, you don't have to start when, you know, when you were born and all that. <laughs> we don't have to go that far. <laughs> yeah. We don't have to go back that far, but I'll kind of tell you about getting into the um, you know, professional world and starting my own business. Um, I come at the marketing space from, the, from the software space. So I started my career at IBM, moved down to Austin, Texas to work, work here, work there. Uh, and I got to work on really big e-commerce stores. So they would sh ship me and my team out to go work on these big stores and we'd help develop sites. Um, being in Austin, I got involved in the startup scene here and just really fell in love with that. So after a few years, I spun off to start a mobile app development agency. And this is way back in the day, at the very early days of the iPhone. You know, I'm sure you were getting started around then too, where uh, apps were brand new. No one really knew how to do them yet. Um, at the time, I was very early in my career, just playing around with some apps on the side and seeing a lot of people looking for help in that area. So decided to start a mobile app development agency. And what or, year was that? What year was that? Um, 2011 is when the that's agency when we started. started. That's when we started Imagine Ovation. Crazy, man. Maybe we were competing with some clients. It's a lucky year. It's got to be a good year. <laughs> a good year. Yeah. But, you know, as you know, then in the early days, just a lot of no one really knowing how to do mobile apps, brand new technology, but it's kind of catching on like wildfire. So yeah. getting in at the right time, we have to work with a lot of different companies. Um, and, you know, just from talking to you, it sounds like you've had a similar experience getting to work with a whole variety of different industries, types of companies in terms of like early stage versus late stage. Um, and seeing that there were the times where you'd build an app, put on the app store and it might go viral, but more often than not, a company would need to have a good marketing plan behind it to get that distribution down. And we saw, we did see a couple get that viral, you know, catch on and go viral and be very successful. But for the most part, if a company did not have a marketing plan behind it, we saw a lot of startups struggle where they'd spend so much time and effort and money on development. And then you put an app in the app store and it's like, who's going to download it? So seeing yeah. that need, I know I was, me and my team were always getting pulled into helping them with marketing right after development because that was just the next step. Uh, and seeing the the need that they had there for it. So I got marketing experience, marketing my agency, and then marketing for our clients. Um, worked on that agency for a bunch of years, ended up selling that. And then knowing I wanted to get more in the marketing world, I, I knew that afterwards. So started up a new agency focused just on marketing. So that's what Speedwork is today, is a marketing agency. And 
with my background in software and tech, that, that was kind of where I naturally worked. So I had a lot of clients in that area. And as I got into the marketing world, I did try a lot of different things to help people. And then saw that LinkedIn repeatedly was giving the best results for those types of clients because it was the, the tech and enterprise space. So since then, we've focused on LinkedIn and it's been you know an interesting niche because in the broad scheme of things, like most people have tried Google or tried Facebook marketing, okay. but a lot of people, not many people have tried LinkedIn, but know that their audience is probably on LinkedIn. You know, for any kind of like enterprise or B2B type of company, they know their audience is on LinkedIn, but they don't know how to use it well. So we focused on that area um, and it's been, it's been an interesting space to be in. The whole marketing space has been interesting over the last year, given iOS 14 and all that stuff, but uh, LinkedIn has been a good space. So since then we focused in just on LinkedIn. It's funny what you said earlier that when a, when a client builds, uh, or let's just call it like a startup, builds a, a mobile app, a product, and they launch it out in the app stores. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been through this too, <laughs> uh, where they'll think like, oh man, once we get it on, on Apple and, and Google Play, it's going to skyrocket. It's going to boom. It's going to do so well. And I, because we used to, because my company used to do, even though we just do development now, we used to do full turnkey marketing and, um, and, uh, and development, like, you know, SEO and all that kind of stuff, content. Um, and we would tell them like, listen, it's all about marketing. You can have the best product in the world, in the world, but if you can't market it, if you can't brand it, if people can't, they don't know what it is or they don't know where it is, it's kind of, I mean, you're as good as dead. You know, you know what I mean? You can have the best product, but right. it just doesn't matter. You've got to market it effectively, man. That's what it's about. You know? Yeah. But, and, and it's about like, how is your product going to resonate in the market? You right. know, so much is going to change once you launch it and get it out there when you see how people receive it. So either you got to do the user testing beforehand or you have to keep have analytics in it to see how people are you know, using your software and how they're responding to it so that you can all work that back in. Right, right. And Anthony, you know, going back to just your, your background, your past and uh, you starting modern media and now kind of transforming to Speedwork Social or rebranded to Speedwork Social. Why, why LinkedIn B2B marketing? Like what made you kind of you know, why that area? Because, you know, marketing is very versatile. It's dynamic. There's so many different avenues, right? There's so many different things you can do. So why LinkedIn? Is it just because the platform is, is really booming? Is it something that you love? Is it just your passion? Well, what is it? Where did it kind of come from? Yeah, I think a few different factors for me. Uh, one is just getting into the space with my background being largely software and then like IBM and like the enterprise tech space. That's where my early my early connections were, and those are the types of people that I started working with early in the marketing space. So um, because that was my background, that's who I worked with, I saw LinkedIn was doing the best for those types of companies. So I decided to continue to, to focus just on the LinkedIn area. Um, and then also, you know, just as starting my own company and working on, on this, there's lots of agencies that specialize in Facebook, lots of agencies that specialize in Google. You know, you could, sure. <laughs> you could throw a rock and hit about five agencies <laughs> that do yeah, that so yeah. linkedin was a unique space where no one was really doing it well no one was really doing it well so um i was seeing good results for clients in that area and then whenever i would go i remember this specifically whenever i'd go to events and be like oh yeah i'm getting into the marketing world i'm doing you know maybe maybe i'm doing some google and some linkedin and everyone's always like oh tell me about the linkedin stuff that's interesting so hearing a lot of feedback for that the people were interested in linkedin and then not many people were doing it I was like, well, then I see a need there and an opportunity. So I decided to focus on that area. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. LinkedIn, man, I, I'm a big advocate for LinkedIn. It's uh, I think for me, uh, it's my favorite social platform. Um, I, call, I kind of call it because I love storytelling, as you know. So I call it more like a storytelling platform. It's becoming more um, LinkedIn's becoming more authentic in terms of people being more vulnerable. If you notice that they're it's not always about business. It's about life too. And I like that, right? Because it doesn't always have to be about business. Yeah. It's a B2B platform. I get it. And, and that's great. It's good. That has that kind of that focus, that niche, but really life and business. I mean, they are connected. You know what I mean? It, it, you can't, it, it's so difficult to separate them. <laughs> um, so it's good to see that authenticity on the platform. Um, and I'm seeing over time that when 
like when people message me, I'm either getting messages that are incredibly spammy. Uh, and you know, you, you and I talked about that, right? And, and I know you guys fixed that because you're great at, in terms of, you know, providing good, good, honest, um, authentic messages um, and helping generate leads for businesses. Uh, but a lot of people don't have that. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And the way they go about it, they just freaking sell you. They give you four paragraphs in, in your, in, in your email or your, you know, your, your DMs. Um, and they're just very spammy. They're unauthentic. They look template-ish. They, uh, they're, they're, they're untargeted. They're unpersonalized. Um, and I respect the automation. I think automation is very important, but you need that human touch too. That's also a vital component. Um, and I like that, yeah. uh, just from working with you guys just a little bit and, and getting to know you, it seems that that's what you and your agency provide, you know? So give us a little bit about that, man. Just kind of like, what does it really take to, um, to generate effective leads, quality targeted leads on LinkedIn? Like what's the right approach? And I know there's so many workflows and things, but just on a high level, how does it kind of work in your mind? Yeah. So there's a couple of things there. Um, first is, first is what you mentioned as far as like people being vulnerable to the platform. So I think LinkedIn's in an interesting space now because Facebook has gotten so Facebook also has got, well, Facebook has gotten so spammy in terms of, you know, if you use Facebook and Instagram, you've probably had these spam bots follow you yep. commenting on your posts. You probably got all these friend requests on, on Facebook that you're like, you know, I can tell this is a bot, you know, from somewhere else. Yeah. So there's also a lot of questionable content posted on Facebook and all that's happened there. So LinkedIn has a lot more trust built into the platform and just like the type of people who use LinkedIn being more business uh, business type of is number one organically it's still a social algorithm so you know what are people going to resonate with the most so that's where the vulnerability comes in because if I'm just posting blog post after blog post or case study after case study then right. you know that's that's not as interesting as mixing it up and then having some personal stuff in there so usually when I I'm talking to people and they're like what should I be posting it should it should be a mixture because you want to share your personality because that's what's going to separate you from a bot is having some personality there somebody getting to know you um, and then you do want to work in you know the business uh, content every once in a while the case study the call to action but having a mixture there uh, and then what works best is uh, number one, matching up who you're targeting with what you're offering. Uh, there's a lot of times where we'll see, you know, a lot of companies do, you know, serve multiple industries or multiple types of decision makers, or they're just like, um, you know, I want everyone in, in the software space, or like, I want everyone in some area. And what we find a lot of our discussions are around, like, how do we get very specific on who is that right decision maker? And what is that person's maybe title or what is that person posting about that makes them a good fit for you? And then how do we match up your offer very specifically to them? Uh, and then a lot of the offer is, you know, a lot of companies do offer lots of different services and maybe have worked with a lot of different clients and you don't want to just share all of that, but maybe pick the one or two most applicable case studies or examples that are going to resonate with this audience and then offering that to them. Um, because people, yeah, people are not gonna read pages of messages, they're not gonna read pages of ads or your landing pages, but what is that one hook that's gonna grab their attention? Now, something that makes this even easier is when we, um, again, back to the, you don't wanna just send people pages of text in either a message or a landing page, but how do we cut that down to what's like the one thing that we can offer them that's gonna get their interest? We call this a lead magnet. So maybe you're going to offer them something like a case study or offer them a freebie of some kind. A lead magnet's like usually a, a quick and easy downloadable that somebody can either read quickly and learn something about, or it's something like um, kind of like a free meeting that you're going to offer them, like, like a free consultation, but for whatever it is for your business that that's valuable to them. Um, you know, for me, it could be, um, well, you know, we'll design a couple ads for free if you're interested. Um, or like, I, you know, I see you're, for us, it could be like, hey, I see you're in the software space. I, I'd be happy to design a couple of ads for you um, because we've worked with lots of software companies based on what's worked well for them. Um, so a lead magnet helps start the conversation. And something overall that I've seen a lot of in the B2B space is uh, comparatively, when you, when you think of B2C, you often think of like 
or I think of like e-commerce stores. And that's usually right. you're gonna buy, you're buying some kind of sports product, you're buying some kind of shirt or something, and it's a it's an easy decision. Or you know, like direct direct to consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You're gonna to go to that website and you're either gonna like it or you're not. You know, maybe you'll come back later to buy it, but it's not as much of like uh a decision it's not as much of like a, an evaluation as much as it's more of a decision whereas in the b2b realm usually offers in the b2b space are more complicated more involved where somebody needs to learn a lot more before they're really ready to buy so something that i find myself talking to people a lot about is you do want to kind of stretch out and plan to stretch out your sales process so that the goal is you know the step one goal is you want to find people who are interested in what you're selling and then once you find somebody who either has that pain point or is interested in your service, then, then they're a candidate to like learn more about you. Mm-hmm. And you need to, and people need to, you know, acknowledge that people aren't probably going to buy off of like one call, especially when, you know, B2B high ticket items are going to be thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. No one's going to pull out their credit card after one call and just purchase. I mean, you might have, you might have a couple people, but uh, it's more often than not that you're yeah. going to need stretch out your sales process to be able to um, walk somebody through, we call it, we call it the consul- a consultative sales process where it's probably starts with an analysis. It probably starts with an intro call and then you have an analysis call and then you have what we, what we call like the feedback call or sharing results from your analysis call. And then that also doubles as like a closing call. So a lot of people, you know, I, I can tell like the people who are early, sometimes I talk to people who are early in business, they're just like, oh yeah, I'm going to one call close people. And it's like, well, in the B2B world, you're probably not. And you need to, you know, if that happens, awesome. It might happen sometimes, but more often than not, you're going to be successful if you stretch that out into like a three-step close. B2B is not really made for impulse buyers. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Right. It, it, you're not buying a, um, you're not buying like a, a granola bar or, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a, like, a, or a protein cereal. Um, it's different, right? It, they're usually more premium services and, and uh, it requires uh, education, uh, inspiration, insight, uh, and I think just time and patience and just building that, building that relationship over time um, and building that trust. And that's what's going to allow you to uh, potentially work with them. You know, you're exactly right, man. And it seems like you're, the, the way the way your agency works and the way your approach works is very uh, personalized. It's very targeted. It's very researched, um, and I think that's I think that's vital, especially when it comes to LinkedIn B two B lead generation and even just overall marketing and, and branding on the platform. It just takes time, you know. Yeah. Consistency. Absolutely. Yeah. So the goal the goal is number, you know first step find people who are interested, whether they have a pain point that you serve or they're interested in in something that you're offering. Number one, find people who are interested. And then after that, then it's a education and nurture process. You know, if it's if it's software, they probably need to go check if their system integrates with what your what your system is or if it's compatible in any way. Um, especially in B2B, they probably have to go talk to somebody else on their team. Maybe they need to involve an IT person or, you know, if they're the owner, maybe they can make the decision. But a lot of times we find multiple decision makers are going to be involved just because people need to go just check things before they pull the trigger in a company. Are you seeing any differences, Anthony, in terms of um, service versus uh, SaaS or even just like physical products uh, on LinkedIn? So I'm sure you've dealt with clients on, on both sides, but do you feel that one works better than the other? Like, so B2B services, let's just say you mentioned mobile app development, that that's a premium service that takes time to build and nurture people um, or through just a, uh, uh, a SaaS that might be a hundred dollars a month or, or, or $25 a month or whatever it is. Is it, do you think that the product SaaS side is also effective on LinkedIn too? Uh, yeah, we do, we do a lot of SaaS related campaigns and um yeah, you know, people kind of go through, well, for the bigger SaaS systems, uh, you know, if it's something like, uh, if it's something like HelloSign, you know, you might buy that for yourself and you probably understand document signing pretty well. So you can mm-hmm. just make that purchase yourself. Kind of anything that's, you know, the, the next step after that is when you get to more complicated software where it's like maybe you're buying it on behalf of your company or as that price tag gets higher, there's more to, look into before you pull that trigger so um we do see this you know whether it's a service or a product even a, even a software product it's often still a consultative sales process that people go through that's cool no, that's cool and 
like what issues or problems, Anthony, are you seeing with what people make in, I know sales and marketing are different, but they're also interconnected. So like, are you seeing any challenges and obstacles that people really keep making or keep going through when it comes to sales and marketing uh, on LinkedIn and even through other channels? Like, what are you kind of seeing? Because I know you're you know, I know you're probably analyzing the data uh, from all of your, your, you know, all your customers and even the data for Speedwork Social, uh, like on a LinkedIn perspective and even just through, uh, you know, any other channels that you use, uh, you know, even email as well. But what are you seeing in terms of like any type of trend or anything that in terms of like just people that are, they keep making the same mistakes over and over again, like on a sales and marketing perspective, what are you seeing out there? Yeah. So I'll tell you the two things. One, one will be the the biggest problem that people make, uh, and then the second will be the biggest, you know, the people that we have most most success. I'll I'll tell you about what they do. So the biggest problem is kind of going back to that three step consultative sales process. The biggest problem are people that just show up to that one call, the first call, and then they expect to close it there. And if they don't close there, they kind of just leave that lead, and they don't come come back to it. Mm-hmm. That person's indicated interest, but you know. Most people don't buy in the first call. So you got to be ready to follow up with your leads. So most people, the biggest issue that we see most people have is going straight for the sale on that first call before that person really knows anything about you. Um, and then to switch gears, the people that we see have the most, the best success. Um, honestly, it's, it's somebody who often has a dedicated salesperson who like, this is their focus. This is their job to just follow up with leads. Um, as, you know, as people are interested, as they become leads, then that person then starts to develop a relationship with them. And, you know, maybe it's the owner of the company, or maybe it is a dedicated salesperson, but, um, once someone's a lead, putting them on an email sequence, sending them follow-up messages so that there's multiple touch points out there. And it's kind of like the mindset that people have is I know someone's going to be successful when, or the the successful teams we work with. They say like once once that lead comes in, our team is just right on top of them. They're you know they're emailing them, they're texting them, they're calling them until they get in touch with them, and just being on top of that process. There also, if you're somebody you know if you're that prospect, to switch the the frame is you know if someone just sends you one email, okay you know they, they, this person emailing me is like you know slightly interested, but if they're sending me multiple emails, multiple calls, multiple text messages. Maybe there's something they saw about me and my business that they know I'm a good fit. So that kind of creates that law of attraction with the more someone's reaching out to me, the more I'm learning about them, the more that I'm going to be interested in what they're reaching out to me about. You know, sure, there's going to be some people who are like, unsubscribe me, you know, I'm not interested. They might realize they're not a good fit, but more often than not, you're going to have a lot more success by having those follow-ups in place. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's like the mindset from like the really successful teams we work with, who they're just like, as soon as that lead comes in, we're all over it. Um, you know, we're calling them, texting them, emailing them. We're getting on that follow-up call, even if it is just a quick intro call. Um, you know, when we look at funnel metrics, a lot of times, if you look at one month or even like quarterly in the B2B world, it's, it's hard to see an ROI over that time frame, but for example, I'm, I'm thinking about one where we we put up funnel metrics for a year and like the ROI, you know, funnel ROI over one month or three months is like low, but over like a year, as those leads start converting, you have you see very high ROIs because again, in BB, if you're selling like hundred thousand dollar packages or something, you close one of those and boom, your ROI is there. So that's that's, that's cool. what we see as like the biggest problem, and then like the mindset from the most successful teams. Yeah, and. You know, I do, I do want to touch a little bit on personal branding, just a little bit. You know, are you noticing that, does it help if you do have a personal brand and then you also have a company, right? Because I think, and I, I get this question a lot, and I even struggle with it myself, just quite honestly, is when you're trying to build your personal brand, you're trying to build that trust for people to just to trust you as a, as a human being, as a person, as a business leader. Um, and then you also have your company that pays the bills, right? You have your company that you're running on a day-to-day basis. Uh, what do you see in terms of connecting both of them on LinkedIn specifically? Do you think it does help or do you think it doesn't really matter? Because I'm sure you've seen both sides of the, be- of the spectrum, right? Where companies do very well, but they don't really have any personal branding, do they? And then you see ones that 
have personal branding and they do very, very well, and maybe their company doesn't do well, but then they're getting consultations like for, for them to be hired as a coach. And even, the, even if they're not a coach, people think, oh, can you help me? Because I see you on LinkedIn. You look like you know your crap. <laughs> you know what you're talking about, you know? So it's like, yeah. what, do you, what are you seeing with that? Because there's a lot of shifts and changes, man, with personal branding. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> Yeah. In terms of personal branding, um, I, I do agree that like you, people, if you're just sharing just purely business stuff, maybe even just like, you know, again, just blog post after blog post, then people aren't going to get it, be interested in that. You know, maybe some people who are, who are interested in that topic, but after a while you might, that might kind of get stale with them. So I don't know, once you connect with somebody or once you like follow somebody, building a personality is what really creates that authentic connection. Whereas like if you're sharing some personal stuff, some business stuff, and then, you know, like you, you have your main business and you have your podcast. Um, and because they are related, people are, you know, people who, who are on, listening to your podcast are probably going to also be interested in like software development or, or they want to hear what's new in the software world. They're going to find that interesting. And then usually, you know, we recommend sharing a mixture of content that shows off your personality because you know, you would want to share some software development information. You'd want to share your podcast. Maybe you want to share some stuff about your personal life so that people can get to know you. Um, and that's, you know, that kind of saves you from having to have all one-on-one -on -one conversations with all these people. But if they're just following yeah. your content on LinkedIn, you're developing that relationship kind of um, passively. So later on, you know, if, if they did come in as a lead from one of your campaigns and then you connected with them, um, you know, maybe they, maybe they submitted a form on your website and then you connected with them. They're going to learn a lot more about you by following your posts over time. And, uh, you know, may, again, maybe they don't buy in that first call, but three months later, they're thinking about it again and they've been seeing your post and they're like, oh yeah, I had a good conversation with this guy. I think I'm ready to move forward now. I'm going to go back to him versus all these other people, all these other like no name, no face vendors that I might've talked to briefly, but I don't really know that well. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely get it. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, sometimes it's hard because, you know, with your personal brand, you, you're you portraying your own experiences, your own stories, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to find different ways to resonate with the audience. And sometimes that can, um, that can be misconstrued with what your company does and your company's values, even though, of course, if you're the leader of that company, I think your values should align with the company's values. If it's your company, I mean, it makes sense, obviously. But it's just uh, sometimes it's tough because, you know, it's just uh, I, I just see. I know I, I've had a lot of questions on this on this kind of topic, uh, just how to connect your personal with your company. And sometimes I think people find it very difficult. So, yeah. You know, but um, so. Anthony, in terms of LinkedIn in general, like where the platform is, is headed, um, I know they've made a lot of algorithmic changes. Um, I know changes are, are just continuously happening with all these platforms, but where do you see LinkedIn going, you know, yeah. in terms of just in, in general? Um, I'll let you kind of touch on that. Yeah, so I think we see, I see LinkedIn kind of going forward in like two areas where um, number one, on the social side, we do see like LinkedIn follows Facebook in a lot of ways. Just the features they release are often somewhat similar. Like they just released Facebook Live this past year. It's about time. <laughs> um, but like Facebook events, um, yeah. we're now, like, during the pandemic, a lot of people are hosting events using, using LinkedIn or promoting them using LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn Stories, LinkedIn Live, and all these other features. So I think we'll kind of see on the social side, we'll see LinkedIn continue to follow Facebook in a lot of ways. Uh, but then also we see LinkedIn kind of following down like the CRM route where like uh, the way that people use like Salesforce, a lot of people are using LinkedIn and like sales navigator kind of as like a CRM system. So I think we're going to continue to see, seeing more steps forward in that way of like, how can I use my network as a CRM or like, how can I make a CRM out of my network? And then, you know, I think they're coming out with a lot of interesting new features in that in that way. And if you've ever used Sales Navigator, there's some very interesting search capabilities for both companies and then people. And then when you match those up and you do searching by company and then searching by people at those company, you can get very specific on specific people. So um, I think we'll see LinkedIn continue to follow down those those ways. And maybe there's some interesting things they roll out from there. Um, so 
On the social side, they'll probably continue to follow Facebook. On like the business side, kind of like Salesforce. Like I'd say, yeah. you know, I, I see them kind of going down like the Salesforce route in a way with Sales Navigator. Interesting. And what about the um, the ad side of things? Do you think LinkedIn's, uh, I mean, do you think they're going to lower their cost per click? I know it's, I mean, at least I know from doing LinkedIn ads comparing to like Instagram, uh, LinkedIn's probably been more expensive. Actually, it has been more expensive. I think the cost per click is higher. Do you think that's changing or do you think the, just the, the algorithm and in, in the, in the, uh, the LinkedIn ads are also changing in terms of, uh, do you think it'll be easier to reach more people um, through the ads than it will be through uh, organic? Because, you know, the, I mean, the platform is growing every single day. Uh, it's heavily, you know, increasing in users, right? So it's, um, it's just becoming more saturated, right? And the more saturation, it's just, I think it's probably going to be, it's getting more difficult to um, get a lot, a lot, a larger reach uh, organically through your content. Yeah, we've seen them release a couple new features recently with LinkedIn ads, and they are starting to support stories now in LinkedIn ads and LinkedIn yeah. events. So I think the ads platform will continue to evolve. I know I've seen like they have, uh, it's still pretty far behind like Facebook's ad platform, but. Um, it is good to see them like moving forward and releasing new features. Uh, I, you know, I believe that LinkedIn ads is a very powerful platform just because the business targeting it offers. Uh, and I think we're going to continue seeing more people move to LinkedIn. And there's a few things involved in that. I think iOS 14 is really, you know, it's going to impact Facebook the most because of so much of Facebook's algorithm it is based on the AI building a profile about somebody based on what they do offsite. So a lot of Facebook's algorithm depends on you know, what sites does this person go to? What sites do they make purchases on? Where are they like adding to cart? Where are they purchasing? What are they reading? Facebook learns a lot about somebody based off those actions. So with that being very reduced due to iOS 14's tracking, um, I think LinkedIn is going to be the least impacted by that. Sure, everyone will be impacted a little bit in terms of conversion tracking, but LinkedIn, all that data we use for targeting is all first party data that people are plugging into the platform themselves. Like, you know, people set their own job title, they associate with a company, that company is pages set up by the company. So it's all put in there by the company and by the person. And we're not losing any of that tracking with uh, iOS 14. So for anything in the business realm, I think we're going to see more and more people move from Facebook to LinkedIn because Facebook tried to build business insights about people based on what they did offsite because most people don't put job titles or companies into Facebook, but they do put it into LinkedIn. So I think we'll see LinkedIn's ads platform continue to grow. I hope we see a lot of new features roll out. Um, they were purchased by Microsoft a couple of years ago and we started, and in the beginning it was like, you know, are they going to do anything or like build anything new? I think it would just took them time on the back end to get things infrastructure. Out. And now we're starting to see a lot of new features released faster. Nice. Yeah, it's always uh, it's always fun to talk about the future of it. It's like where is it going to go, and where you know where are things headed? Uh, there's just so many changes, man. From just like post COVID, I don't even say post COVID. I know there's some there's a lot of uh, companies still struggling, but um, a lot of yeah, a lot of countries still struggling. But yeah, it's uh, even just in the post COVID world, I guess here in the states, there's just so much innovation and and. So many things that are, are happening, man. It's uh, sometimes hard to keep up with it. There's, there's, but the good thing is, is that there's a lot of innovation. I think, I think um, it seems companies have reset and uh, and they're thinking differently and they're, they've reshifted and, and they've pivoted, um, some in negative ways, some in positive ways. But I, I think a, a reset once in a while is, is good, um, obviously, without hopefully next time without any tragedies and things like that, you know. Um, no. But... It's just it's sometimes it's the reality of it, right? So, but yeah, man. Um, so I, I want to get a little, just a few minutes, uh, Anthony, into you and your business and just your overall story and some of the things that you've gone through uh, as a company, as, a, as an agency, you know, kind of getting a little deeper here. So for you, you started Modern Media, what year was it? 2016, end of 2016. Okay. And I, and I know you rebranded, uh, was it a few years ago? Uh, uh, I rebranded just a couple, few months ago. Really? Awesome. Okay, yeah. cool. So just like with that being said, when you started Modern Media in 2016, what was it like in the first few years for you? Was it 
as hard as other people say it is in, in terms of starting, growing, scaling a startup? Did you go through a lot of what startups go through or it was it, did it come easier to you? Sometimes it does. You know, was it just like the demand was there, the market was there, you planned everything, you you were efficient in your processes, you you grew an operation. Like how did it kind of work for how did you work it? How did you how did you grow it? Yeah, I wish I could say I had a master plan behind all of it, but really it was kind of an exploration process where I knew I was I I knew what I had seen at the software mobile agency, mobile development agency. And I knew what I saw there in terms of like the needs that these companies had opportunities to help them in the marketing space. So I knew I wanted to get into the marketing world and I kind of knew that area, but in terms of like, you know, at the time, if you, if I, if you would have told me I would be working in LinkedIn and specializing in LinkedIn, I would have been like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, not have expected that at the time. And, you know, I think for a lot of companies, the beginning is often like an exploration process. And, and even you mentioned it at the beginning of this call of, you know, wherever a product starts, they might not know their target audience. And it probably is going to be something different that we find once you get some data in, once you see how people are using it. Yeah. And I think, you know, that is true for many, many companies, uh, especially new companies. Um, you know, I think it's about getting out there and trying a lot of different things and seeing what works and maybe what kind of resonates the best for you and your leadership team um, and seeing what areas you want to play in. Because in the beginning, I knew I wanted to do marketing and help, you know, help tech and software companies with marketing, but I never would have expected LinkedIn. So in the beginning, I was like, oh, you know, SEO or Google ads or Facebook ads, because that's what yeah. everyone was talking about. But uh, then it was, you know, some pivoting and trying out LinkedIn Whoops, my screen just turned off. Sorry about that. Oh, no, you're good. Um, but it was pivoting and trying a couple of different areas and then realizing, you know, and then finding my own niche in that space and that turned out to be LinkedIn. So since then, focusing on LinkedIn. Uh, and then I guess the other story I can tell is like in the rebranding process, uh, branding is like a whole big category in its own. And like, there's so much strategy that goes into that. Mm -hmm. So I a lot of like research and learning in that space and reading about a lot of things and you know kind of what I found is like you can go deep and figure out brand archetypes and all that the one thing that I spent a lot of time thinking about like was the name basically like that's where I spent most of my focus and the reason why I started the rebranding process is because modern media it worked for just being a generic marketing agency but it's also a generic name that there were several other marketing agencies with a similar or the same name you could type in modern media to google and find you know five other agencies that did similar things so you know especially as i was getting into the podcast getting on podcasts a lot and like getting interviewed on things i'm like if someone goes to google for me they're probably going to end up on somebody else's website think it's us could even sign up for them because it's a marketing agency so um that was that kind of started the need of a rebranding process and then getting into it I spent most of my focus on like thinking about the name and like everything else kind of came around that. But a name is a handle, a name is a handle that takes up space in someone's mind. So good names are simple, short and catchy. So what we, what I eventually found, you know, ended up liking was Speedwork. There was no other agency's name Speedwork. We had the speedworksocial.com domain name. Um, it kind of has like a, you know, a fun connotation to it, speeding up your work. And then, you know, it's kind of, you know, marketing speeds up, speeds up your funnels, speeds up your business. So there's a lot of like fun connotations to that. And it just kind of seemed like it stuck the best. Um, so some people get pretty complicated with names or getting into acronyms and stuff, but a name is a handle in someone's mind that needs to be memorable and needs to be able to associate, have associations with it. So that's where I spent a lot of my time and ended up, and ended up landing on speed work. And just like with some of the the tough things that you and your company have gone through, has it, have you had your moments where, you know, you're just thinking like, you know, how am I going to make payroll or how am I going to pay myself? Or did you, did you go through that too? Typically? I mean, I, me and my company, we went through that several times where, um, you know, this is me. I, I always, I've said this in a few other episodes, but um, it, it really does test you. Uh, emotionally, mentally, uh, physically, uh, there's just a lot of aspects about 
growing your own business that are very difficult and you have to love what you do. The love and the passion, the joy is going to get you through a lot of those tough times. Uh, you know, I think Steve Jobs said it, you know, we're all kind of crazy, um, <laughs> you know, in our own way, you have to be crazy to, to build a business. Um, but for you, have you had to really have those crazy moments um, and really just push through and, and, and just uh, keep moving forward? I'm sure you have, right? Absolutely. I'm yeah. sure every business owner has probably gone through, you know, similar in their own way, events like that. Um, you know, the couple I think about is like, one is when I decided to focus on LinkedIn and I, I decided to turn away projects that weren't in that space. Cause I could like, just even just seeing myself, I could see that when, you know, even, a, even simple as like knowing that I'm going to be in LinkedIn all day versus needing to open up Facebook and remember where to go in that interface and what to look at and what metrics typically are in that area. Just that mind space that that takes up. I knew I needed to, you know, if I, I knew that if I wanted to get good at LinkedIn, I needed to drop the Facebook and the Google stuff because it was just distracting me where, where now I know that I'm really good at LinkedIn because I like, I can just pop it in, pop it open. I know what the metrics are supposed to be. I know exactly where to go. And I'm able to then support a lot more clients because I can be a lot more efficient in that area. And then supporting a lot more clients makes me learn a lot more from those clients and that, you know, you learn a little bit about, you learn something new from every client because they're always a little bit different. Um, whereas if I needed to switch gears and go do Facebook stuff or to go do Google stuff, that distracts me and keeps me from getting good in the LinkedIn space. So I'd say that's one thing that I thought about a lot is like, you know, making that decision to focus on one area and then actively turning away opportunities in these other areas because I knew that they were just going to distract me. And then nowadays seeing the perform, you know, I know that we can push a lot better performance out of LinkedIn than most other people because we have focused on this area and we've built out additional tools and um, tracking where I can calculate, met I'm tracking, calculating metrics because I've gone through this so many times that I know what to look for down the funnel and down the line of a campaign. I know how that's going to play back into my tracking in the beginning. So we have a lot more infrastructure built, built out to help prepare for that. Um, so I'd say that's like one thing that I think that I, I remember thinking a lot about was like, I need to act, you know, I need to focus on this area if I want to get really good at it. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely something uh, that is tough for a lot of, uh, a lot of businesses, a lot of entrepreneurs is they try to do everything for everybody. Um, you know, we, we've even gone through that and it's, it's just kind of having that agnostic approach, right. Of just being everything to everyone, as I said. Right. So and just makes it very difficult to market. It makes it difficult to brand because it's it's hard to know who's your ideal uh, client, right? Who's your who's your ICP, your ideal client prospect? So when you can hone in and focus on something that you love, something that you have strong capabilities in, skills in, um, and you know that there's a market, you can just you know uh, have that tunnel vision and just just hit it, go after it, and it's it's, it's a lot easier. And yeah. I know a lot of us make that mistake. You know, we, we want to serve everyone, man, right? We want to serve everyone, but it just doesn't work that way. It's, it's better yeah. to serve like one audience and do it better than try to serve everyone and kind of do it okay. Yeah, it's definitely very hard in the beginning, like especially when you're just getting started. Well, especially when you're still in the early days, it's very hard to turn away projects or like work where you're like, you know, this is an opportunity right here, but I'm going to actively say no to this because I want to focus in this other area. It's, it's being aware of the opportunity cost that comes comes with taking that opportunity. Right. So, and yeah, another that, thing, oh, go ahead. Yep. I was just saying that's something that I thought a lot about. Yeah, yeah. And no, I think you touched on a lot of valuable points, uh, Anthony. I think what people can learn from this is if you can niche and you can focus, uh, and let's just say you do have to turn down business, and it's going to happen. If you do focus, you're going to turn down business because you're going to, get found on different social or, or marketing uh, channels uh, that people think that you do something else. It just, it happens, right? Um, and when you stick to what you're good at and stick to your focus and where you're, where you're headed, where you're going, you try to achieve these goals and objectives, you're very strategic and you're very aligned on where you want to go with your team, um, that's going to that's gonna attract better quality clients. And I've learned that through my entrepreneurial process as well, uh, is if you're pickier with who you're trying to work with, 
it actually, it's weird, man, but it, it almost like it, it does value. It, it shows you're more valuable and more, um, it just, it just shows that you have a, a, a more of a dent in the market. It shows, at least that's what, that's the feedback I've gotten from people is that when you're kind of focused, um, it just shows that, you know, what you're doing, you know, what you're talking about and you're willing to turn down business. You know what I mean? And it just shows like you're an expert, you're an, you're a thought leader, an authority in your field. And I think yep. that's, that's huge. Yeah, absolutely. You know? So, but um, one last one last question I, I have, Anthony, before we, before we uh, conclude here is I always ask this question uh, to every interviewee uh, just in regards to your story. And it could be your life. It could be your business, your career, whatever, whatever you want, you can choose. But think of one word that defines your story. Just one word that defines Anthony Blattner. What would that one word be? I'll say pivot. <laughs> okay pivot if you would ask me at the beginning of my career if i'd be doing marketing i would have been like what i got out of the software world and then if, if you asked me at the beginning of my marketing career if i would have been on linkedin i would have been like what i would never would have expected that so i'll say pivot yeah pivot. cool man awesome i appreciate it anthony thank you so much buddy uh, I, I think you've given a lot of uh, amazing uh, information and uh, knowledge and inspiration to, to a lot of people. And uh, I think people will definitely learn from this. So thank you very much, man. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate Perfect. it. Thanks for yeah. yeah. And you have a great time uh, there. Yeah, absolutely. And where can, uh, where can everyone find you? Uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Anthony Blattner on LinkedIn. Feel free to send me a connect for a request and we'll chat there. Uh, you can, Find us online at speedworksocial.com. We have a lot of LinkedIn content there. Uh, and then you can email me at anthony at speedworksocial.com. Cool. Everyone check him out. Uh, Anthony's a, a, a really good guy and uh, has, a, has a nice thing going uh, with, his, with his company. And, um, you know, we're working with him as well. So definitely vouch for him. And we're very, very excited for the future. So thanks again, Anthony. I appreciate it, man. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm your host, Michael Giorgio from Tales from the Pros. And until next time, thanks, guys. Please subscribe to our YouTube page and also follow our social media. Uh, there are links somewhere around here. But uh, we really appreciate it, guys. Thanks for all the support. And I'm going to be giving you awesome content continuously. And we look forward to seeing you soon.